bit. I'm the security and compliance consultant for Internet Work Engineering. This is Eli. Eli would love to collect your business card. And what, if you'll give him your business card at the end of this session, we're going to draw a quick door prize for everybody. So uh, just make sure he keeps your business cards to get into the job. We're going to go over lots of fun stuff. Um, Cycle budgeting. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term, basically what that means is, is when you're buying desktops for your users, laptop for your users, you have, a, you have an idea in mind of exactly the life cycle of this thing, when it should be retired, what you're going to do with the hard drive when it is to be retired, and you're budgeting for the next replacement for it. Uh, what happens there? So you're not caught with trying to provide a whole group of users with extra laptops or extra desktops and things like that. Easy one, firewall log review. How many people actually review the firewall logs that you have? Yeah, you're not ready. That's all right. <laughs> you got the nice, pretty, blinky box, but the last thing anybody wants to do is actually look at the thing, right? Actually look at the data. It's a pain to look at anyway. Um, I'll tell you again, you know the most important fire. You know the most important firewall logs to review. What's the most important thing that you should be looking at when you're looking at firewall logs? I want to hear a brand new snort calendar here. I'll even narrow it down just a little bit. Incoming or outgoing? Now, why out? Why do you care so much about going out? Exactly. That's the stuff that you've got to really worry about because you're already infected and it's home and home. Knocking on the door is not as big a deal. It's a concern, but when it's when it's home and home, you've got issues. Accurate asset list. That's fundamental to risk management. Anybody have a really good, strong feel of that number of assets and the maturity of the assets and all the good stuff on your network? It, it, it's a good thing to keep up with. I know it's a you know it's one of those time-consuming jobs that's really hard to dedicate people. Software ownership. You see this in large organizations, large companies and stuff, but you guys dedicate, for example, uh, all of W products. You have one person responsible, either an IT or a business partner or a business um, liaison, who actually, they are responsible for all things that are, or they are responsible for all things Microsoft. You have some, somebody dedicated to something like that. It's an interesting concept. The first time I ever actually saw it in practice was over at Bank of America and believe me, when somebody has accountability and somebody has ownership of a product class, things get done. All of a sudden, they start to worry about patching. Think about how many times Oracle, um, how many times you have to patch Java and remove the old stuff off of it, right? You need to You put somebody in charge of it, this is your role, it actually starts to get done. And vulnerability scanning, nobody really does that, right? Anybody run vulnerability scans? Awesome. Um, product of choice. What do you guys use? Nessus. Nessus. Who else is doing vulnerability scans? 
guess it's interesting. So are they going to manage all the everything basically? is it's probably not your home IoT devices. Your oven and your fridge are probably not communicating with the mothership trying to take down your, your workplace. Although, if you happen to have some older DVR products and older cameras and things like that, there is a likely chance there is a, there's a supplier, Alexa, an electronic supplier in China that has pretty much made all the components. So if you, you know, in your county or your city or your, you know, wherever you're working at, if you actually have older cameras and older DVR systems, say older than say five years old, and they're not, you know, Panasonic or something super name brand, take a look. There's a good chance that it might actually be trying to phone call. If it's behind your firewall, it's probably, hopefully, it won't, again, review the outbound firewall logs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> everything got affected last week, and it seems to be ongoing. There's still quite a bit of traffic flowing through. Uh, they got some mad at Brian Krebs when he started reporting on it. They actually turned the, the uh, DDoS onto him. And if I read right, I want to say it was 660 gigabit sustain that was flowing through Akamai. That's a huge stream. I mean, that, that's, that's what happened when we torque off the hackers. Um, and by the way, this was only 10% of that box. Um, this is the list, this is the short list that I hope you guys can see. Um, some of the ones that kind of stick out, Axis IP cameras, um, that was the camera to have you know, probably more than three five years ago, something like that. Um, Samsung IP cameras, they're on the list. All Xerox printers have that vulnerability. <laughs> um, it's something to take a look at. Again, if it's behind your network, there's a an excellent chance that it's not affected, but it's still worth patching because what happens is if you get attacked by somebody else and they can leverage that vulnerability that can fit around the network. <clears throat> I like to break the pragmatic approach into two different areas, basically process and enforcement. Additions to the network require vetting and approval from IT. Anybody have an issue with uh, shadow IT? a department that just loves to add, say, uh, wireless devices and controls and all that kind of good stuff when you're not looking. Um, that's where this comes in. This is basically fully a relationship. This is something you get, you know, you get ownership from the top, you know, whether it's your city, your county manager, your city manager, whoever, and you know, that becomes a policy. Figure out a way to get a big stick to enforce it a little bit. Technology is researched and approved and managed by IT. Of course, you know, your users and your other folks are going to try to shorten the cycle of deployment as quickly as they possibly can. But you need time to research it. You need time to actually determine what the issues are. Again, I come back to technology as an owner. Someone who is responsible for knowing the life cycle, who has the contact, <coughs> who can answer the questions that when they hit the fan, somebody knows those answers. Large, again, large organizations have been doing it for years. It's something that we as small, you know, small organizations and music municipalities really need to take a look at. <coughs> Enforcement, <coughs> rights from users. Um, practically, it, you know, think of it in fire terms. Fire, you know, a typical fire needs oxygen, fuel, and heat to survive. A full-blown attack needs a vulnerability, 
admin rights to execute and somebody to actually click the button. You can remove two, you can only <coughs> one of those, pull the admin rights away, and it's not as, as successful as If you have users that absolutely require admin rights, if you have developers, if you have somebody who has one of those god awful sticker printers that just doesn't work without admin rights, force up UAC a little bit. Make, you know, make it painful every time that they have to actually use the rights and they have to check up okay. Um, 8021X, is anybody doing port off? Okay, is anybody doing ICE? Anybody doing Cisco ICE? Look at Cisco ICE, aka okay, NAC. Thoughts, what do you think about it? Are you guys using it? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know much about it, but I know I never got this. Cisco ICE is port off um, 8021X on steroids. It actually does posturing and things like that ahead of time. So. <coughs> Straight up 802.1x, which is port authentication, means that nothing gets plugged in without being, well, it can be plugged in, it just doesn't work until it's off of us. Somebody actually has to go into the switch and turn it up. The cheap way to do that is all ports are administratively down until someone turns it on. Also, to scan for vulnerabilities in new devices. The folks that are using Nessus, how often do y'all actually run what's called a discovery scan? Did I ever do discovery scans? Good, good practice to be in. Um, I like, you know, my suggestion is, again, we're a tenable vendor. Um, we actually tell folks that they should be running the discovery scan at least once a quarter. Find out what's new on the network. If you run in larger um, implementations of things like Tenable Security Center, you can actually tie those in at any time. Anytime something gets plugged into the network, it'll posture it for you, which is effectively the discovery scan. Here's one nobody really likes. Anybody doing or successful on data classification? What's uh, Has anybody tried to go down the path of data classification? Even the simple stuff, maybe just looking at sensitive data versus non-sensitive data. <laughs> you get a calendar from shaking your head, that's awesome. <laughs> Honestly, this is one of those type things that you guys can actually do. Of course, it requires manpower. Of course, it takes time. But it's one of those things that supports multiplier. If you know where your sensitive data is, if it's all contained on one enclave on like a SAN or on a couple of servers, then you can focus your resources on those boxes. And you don't have to have this tremendous spend on your entire network. Think of it like PCI. PCI is ridiculous. It's not going to keep you secure, but the one thing PCI actually brings to the table that everybody should be looking at is the ability to segregate your data. If you, anybody have to adhere to PCI standards? Anybody successfully been able to descope parts or all of your network yet? Maybe sort of kind of? Same theory. You want to limit the scope. As you limit the scope of sensitive data, financial data, higher risk type stuff, Limit that scope all the way down, and only have to apply those enhanced security controls on those small groups. Then you're not spending tons and tons of money. When we have these conversations, you know, when I have conversations with my sales guys, and you know, we try to sell, you know, some really um, not just expensive, but really complex security tools out there. And some of those tools, if you try to apply to your your entire network, I don't think anyone would be able to afford it. Number one. First question is. What can we start with and can we keep that scope as low as possible? Can we contain what's really important? Anybody segment off your HR network? HR guys? Great idea. Or better yet, how about the elections office? Who has to support elections in your county? You guys are nervous about the Russians these days? <laughs>
sound familiar? That you people up at night? What was not know what's going on on my network right now? First place to start, know your network. You might know, uh, everybody, you might remember that a guy named Ron Gula. Um, he's one of the founders of Tenable. That was, he actually coined that phrase, uh, know your network. What does normal traffic look like? Should you, I mean, you know, do you have segmentation or do you have VLANs on your network where you would know whether or not somebody was sending data from finance over into, uh, into the elections office or somebody sending data from the elections office over to the land, micro land management or something like that? Would you know that when it happens? Who's doing anything with NetFlow? Anybody doing anything with NetFlow? That's one of those things that I bet you probably have a switch that speaks NetFlow. Okay. You know, you, there, there's some really complex solutions out there, some really solid solutions, but you don't have to start with a super expensive one. Pipe the flow data into something so you can see what it is, so you can baseline your network. It's huge to have an understanding of what your data flow looks like. And oh, by the way, all my folks that actually raise their hands on the PCI, do you know what that traffic flow looks like? Because if you did an attestation, you probably signed it and said you did. So go back and make sure you understand what that traffic looks like. Time to get to work. If you don't know what it looks like, easy place to start. If you've got a switch that's capable of expanding, better yet, do you have a tap or an old hub? Span it off, tap it off, get some PCAPs, use a TCP dump for Wireshark will do it itself. I'm a huge fan of TCP dump, so to be honest with you. Um, Wireshark does a great job of reading, but it does not do a great job of capturing. I would capture it with a tool like TCP Dump. This is TCP Dump output, output right here. This is actually Wireshark to read it. Um, if you got new guys working for you that are just eager to learn, point them toward Wireshark. Let them be the packet guy. Uh, dig into it. Figure out what normal looks like. This is huge. Because here's the catch. <clears throat> if, if you're getting attacked and you get some ransomware on your network and you call internet work engineering and you say, hey, I need to talk to a security person about um, ransomware. And I can get out there and say, okay, well, you got any idea how it got on there? Yeah, you know, Bob Bannon Finance clicked on this thing and we think it can't come out. That's absolutely possible. But it's also possible that somebody pivoted from Jane's machine onto Bob's machine and locked it down because they figured out that Bob actually has more, uh, more interesting data that they would pay more. For me to be able, for you to be able to answer that question, you've got to kind of understand what the flow of the traffic is. Did you get all the, you got all these? Did we get business cards from everybody, by the way? Or if you don't have business cards, use your little sheet and we'll put your name on it. We want them to draw somebody's name because I've got another Amazon card to give away. <coughs>
data that should never be flowing from one place to the other. They had the tool, they had it in place, they detected it, and unfortunately it was an outsourced group that had no process or policy that says, okay, once detected, you should probably send it to the guy in charge. I don't have that. Let's throw it in the floor. That's actually what happened. So when you build processes, go through the process of what to do when things go south. Make it a routine, daily, weekly. Make sure you know, give someone a responsibility and a backup. This is what they do. They do this on Wednesday afternoon. They're supposed to review through the logs. And look for automation opportunities. There are tons of products out there. We sell quite a few of them. We sell services that do this type of stuff. But I suggest if you're not doing it now, try it yourself. That way you know exactly when you come to talk to people like me or some of my sales folks, that you know what you're looking for. This is one of my favorites. This is the lower end version. It's called Snorby. Anybody ever heard of Snorby? Feed log files. Feed IDS is directly into Snorby. Let it actually flow up and find what's important for you. That way, when you outgrow Snorby, you know what you're at, you can have an educated conversation and not let you know some sales guy knock you down and say, you know, what you really need is this four billion dollar solution. And what you need is something that functions this way that can scale the way it should. You're not taking notes on this kind of down our sales guy. What's in the news? Yes.
best and trust the fire button. So make sure that it's not going to blow anything. This is an easy one. Who does security awareness training? It's, uh, what's, what's your success? Tell me, what you guys, what's been successful about it? I, I think the best for me is that uh, I get comments from the users telling me, oh, I, I think that's, that looks suspicious, so I didn't do it. Right. And so that, to me, that makes me feel good that they actually uh, They're paying attention. They're paying attention, yeah. And, and they send me emails, which I'm like, oh, thank you. No problem. Um, I, I think that, you know, just having them have that email or, right. or send it to me, and I'm like, don't send it to me. You can just take a picture of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just, just, I don't need it. I, I, can, I can go find it if I need it. Trust well, it does this one. I click on it. Yeah. <laughs> so also, uh, I found out too that um, we, we did a fishing test. Yeah, did a fishing awesome. Test. Really? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I did it two days before failed, my class. And found out that some of the managers actually failed the test where the regular people did. Yeah. Probably repeatedly, I would imagine. And one, yeah. one I faced with it and said, I didn't do it. I didn't click on it. Yeah. But the report says it did. So. Right, right. The first <laughs> test we did, we had a 75% failure rate. Really? Wow. Yeah. On a fishing oh. test. Yeah. I'm going to try that. <laughs> and actually, what are you guys using for fishing tests? Well, yeah. we contracted with Mill before. Okay. Yeah. And they, they, give, they give you fishing tests on a monthly basis, and they have a stack of them. I just Kevin Bittnick's website. That's it, Kevin Bittnick. Yeah. yeah. That's the yeah. training that they provide. It's the same one we do. Yeah. Okay. Um, we actually, we perform it, you know, we do some fishing tests, we also do awareness training. And I'll tell you what we've had success on, this is kind of interesting. So when they get the fishing, you know, and it's got a link in there, it's got an embedded package or something like that, the first thing that we actually do when they click on it, <coughs> obviously it takes it off, off the checkbox, but it also takes them to a page and it explains this is how it happens. This is what you clicked on, this is what could have happened. And oh, by the way, we're having this follow-up training here in about three weeks, and you got an invitation. You got a great time. So that's one of the things that I suggest you do. If you're going to do a fish against your employees, is make sure you put something behind it so they, that's a really good retention moment. You know? We have the mandatory training that everybody had to watch the video before they even did the first fishing test. <laughs> that's awesome. And they evidently just failed to rise. The unfortunate thing that I had was. Uh, the management, I, I, I told them that I could give everybody a video to watch for 45 minutes. Oh, that's too long. They can't they can't sit for 45 minutes and watch a video. So I just dropped it right there. So <laughs> you gotta have management cooperation. You, you really do. And you know that's that's, a, that's an excellent point. You know one of the things that I always suggest, of course, it's not my slide today, is practice building use cases. Um, You should always have like a couple of use cases in your back pocket when you're going to go talk to you, to management and folks like that and say, you know what, yeah, you're pulling them away from their job duties for 15, 20 minutes or something like that. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. um, <clears throat> but here's the thing. Think about how long you're going to be here at night when we have ransomware and what you're going to have to talk to your PR person about so that they can tell it on the local news. because. Then it kind of carries a different resonance. You know, I used to, I've been working in security so long it was actually, I was working in security before there was an official job by before, basically. <laughs> um, but the way that I used to explain it to some of the folks, you know, some of the higher ups that, you know, I was working for, so to speak, not my management, obviously, but the way I would explain it to, you know, the higher ups was my job is very simple it's to keep your ass out of the newspaper. That's what I do. And so that's, have to be prepared for those conversations because they're going to push back every single time. Anything they can. If it's money, if it's resources, it's time, they're always going to push back. Obviously, users are your first line of defense. I love the fact that you actually get the retention. You know, they're going to start calling you, they're going to start sending you emails. Hopefully, they're sending you the payload package. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, once a year, we have security rights training, and if it's not completed within 60 days, we actually that's correct. That's better than the wall of shame. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm a fan of wall of shame, but I like that the term off. Yeah, man. Um, what, do you, what else do you guys do for retention? 
folks that are doing awareness training, what do you do to kind of reinforce the, uh, the reinforcement of the training so that if they retain it a little bit? Do I do anything? Posters, calendars, any of that kind of stuff? I do stuff? have a couple of posters yeah, from the state. They send out the stuff. I use that. Yeah, working counties or cities, do you have print shops? If you have a print shop, you're in luck because you can probably print off a calendar for less than a buck and it's all money money anyway. Print off the calendars. It gives them something to look at every single month and you can put your messaging out there. Everybody wants a calendar. Kind of like a snort calendar. Come out. By the way, if you want a snort calendar, stop by our booth. We've got more of them out there. Stop by come see us. But that's an easy retention. The other thing, uh, posters are huge. Anybody know where the best place to put a poster? Bathroom. Break shop. Where at? Break room. Break room. Somebody, I thought somebody said it. Bathroom. 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 Put it right on the stall door. <laughs> Got to pay attention to something, right? So, <laughs> right there. Yeah. Um, I also like to do a couple other tricks, and that's one of the things that we do when we're doing that. We do it in two different ways. We do full-blown training for folks, awareness training, and things like that. But we also do workshops to help people actually build awareness training go through and when I'm actually going through that process I've got a few different you know, samples and things and give them places to order the type stuff. And one of my favorite things is fortune cookies. Put your awareness message in the fortune cookie. You can order those from a certain company. Put them in break rooms. You're going to crack it up and then who can resist opening a fortune cookie, right? It's there. you got to break it. you got to look at it, right? So all of a sudden they're subliminally reading the awareness message. Works good. The other one, when I was over, I used to work at uh, Time Mark Cable for a while, but Favorites and again, that's for you actually. Since you got your print shop, print out a bunch of uh, uh, stack of uh, notepads, right? Put you know, 50, 60 of the little notepads on there and give them away, right? Right on the top of the ones that we used to produce in the security group says, Do not write your password here. Jeez, you know, it carries a message and it's right there in front of them. Um, and again, results can be amazing. I can't tell you how many times follow-ups to our discussions and our training workshops that we have that I have users from other companies email me. You wouldn't even believe what happened, this happened, this happened. And a lot of times it's about not about work, it's about home. You know, these crazy people tried to call my mother and they tried to get her to give her credit card away and all this other good stuff and I learned about this in the workshop and blah blah blah. You know, all the better, you know, if we're really trying to go after the cyber miscreants, let's just do it before. Economical tools. There's a lot of really cool tools I've got up on the board that you can use that are either reasonable or free. Um, Wireshark, obviously. NMAP. Anybody use NMAP? You can actually do some basic vulnerability management as well as um, incident response with NMAP. It is a really cool tool to use. Um, Nagios. Nagios, the pools actually started charging a little bit, but it's nowhere near as expensive of the other tools. Basically, it's a, it's a platform that does up-down tracking. It'll pipe all of your stuff into it for uh, knowing about your firewall logs and all this type of stuff. Nagios is something that loads up on Linux and also they have, they have a free pack or yeah, a free uh, <coughs> OVA that you can pipe directly into VMware or something like that. Um, some of the ob obvious ones, MS Excel, find the uh, most prolific Excel user you've got get them to do VLOOKUPs for you. <laughs> I'm kind of lazy. I like to find the guys that work. And so Excel, I mean, if, if you've been doing log review for a while, that's, that's probably your best friend. <coughs> Notepad++. Plus Plus. Anybody a big fan of Notepad++? Plus Plus? All of every love. All of every love. Open DNS. Shameless plug. We are a big Cisco shop. Uh, Cisco bought Open DNS. Um, one of the lesser known things, there is a product called OpenDNS Premium. They have now have like six products in their portfolio. Premium's free. It's the one that we all used to use that you register, you send data into, and you can actually see. The only thing it doesn't do is compare to the pay products is it does not block. But you can actually see what's talking out, what's what's going on, what's your you know, what, what's going on in your network that's trying to get a bad sites and things like that. Considering OpenDNS, which I really strongly you take a look at OpenDNS, especially given the fact of what happened last week, um, 
Take a look at the DNS. First, take a look at premium. It's absolutely free. Um, you can actually see your traffic, and it gives you an idea of what to expect. Just imagine that block right on top. Um, Nessus Pro. Um, Nessus Pro runs right around two grand right now. It is fundamental for security, uh, for vulnerability management, for some type of a vulnerability scan. This is by far my favorite. That's why I picked it for our company to actually be sell as a partner. Uh, this is baked into the entire product line, uh, general security center, and all the way up. Snort. Who's used Snort? Snort's good stuff. Of course, Cisco bought um, uh, uh, Sourcefire, so actually owns all of the code for Snort, but they are not going to tear it apart. They're not going to deep six it. I suggested. You want to try to either proof your IPSs and IPSs that you have in place or consider adding new IPSs and IPSs in place. Start by doing a, a simple deployment of Snort. Run something like Barnyard on the back end or base so you can actually read the rules or pipe them into something like NatGIS or, or FreeSplum. And see what's actually going on in your network. That way you can have, again, have the educated conversation or at a minimum you make sure your IPS is configured like it should be. Splunk still has a free product, believe it or not. Um, it was a time where one of their models used to be Splunk free as a beer. It gets a little more expensive these days, but you can, to my knowledge, still pipe in up to 500 feet a day. So, <clears throat> these are all fairly economical. They're basic tools to kind of give you a start on a decent uh, pragmatic security approach. So, really, uh, shameless plugs. Um, Again, we're from IE. Um, we've actually redone our website. If you guys have ever seen the old IE website, it was kind of like one of the way back machines and what the website took back in the early 90s. Um, Eli and his cohorts have done a great job of making it look a whole lot better than it used to. Including we have a, we have a security blog as well as blogs for our other architectures. So if you want to kind of see what the latest and greatest and what I'm scratching my head on these days, it's usually on our blog. And oh, by the way, um, one of the latest blog entries that should be out probably within the next couple of weeks. Um, did anybody get a chance to come to our October Tech Fest? You guys missed out. Anybody IE customers first off? So once a year, we have a big customer appreciation thing where we give away a lot of beer. Um, we call it the October Tech Fest. Um, this year, carrying the thing forward, uh, being the social engineer that I actually am and the grayish hacker that I am, I managed to convince my management to it's a cake um, And we turned it into a cake lot. We, uh, we actually put a few solenoids in there, put a couple of raspberry pies, turned the thing into basically a dispensary to where anybody that came out to it had to hack into it to make it more beer. Uh, that entire blog entry on how we built it, what we did with it, how much beer I actually drank will be on our blog site. <laughs> and if you're interested in seeing it, we're going to be doing a road show. It will be at our office or a hotel with large accommodations in Charlotte, in Raleigh, probably Georgia Coast at some point, and some of our other operating areas. So if you want to come out and take a look at the beer bot, have some beer on us, take a look. The great thing about it is, is we'll spin up a Cali platform tap platform and we let you hack for me. Now what we do just to kind of you know, throw in a plug for Cisco because they do pay the bills half the time and some of our other uh, partners, we actually put those security controls between you and the Cali platform and the beer bar. So I will teach you how to completely circumvent a firewall. So we'll and that's the important part. Um, we have all types of different security solutions, of course, and we have on-demand professional services. And oh, by the way, please stop by the booth. We're actually playing, what's that game? Who wants, to, who wants to be a millionaire? If you answer all the questions right, you're, um, actually, if you answer all the questions right, the prize is $1,000 worth of on-demand services in the form of a, what is it? It's a, yeah, it's a device assessment, a device so if you want to kind of look at your firewall, make sure it's actually working right, we'll do that. Grand prize, which is all you got to do is participate, um, and we'll be drawing that tomorrow, is $5,000 for tender services. 
So if you'd like to have a CCIE for a week, Booth. If you have any more questions, if you want to see um, these products in action, I'll be glad to spin them up for you. If you want to talk about beer, uh, we'll have all day. <laughs> and uh, well, we appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank <laughs> you. 